Hi, everyone. My name is Skylar Baylor. I'm super excited to be here. I'm really thankful for the Alliance for being able to have this event and for you all to be able to hear different voices of, of different experiences. So um, welcome. Um, again, I'm Skylar. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am 24 years old. I am currently talking to you from Seattle or um, st stolen land from the Duwamish or the Sal Coast Salish peoples. Um, I, uh, I grew up in D.C., um, I am an athlete, so I swam for four years at Harvard University, and that allowed me to be the first transgender athlete to compete for a Division I men's team. Um, I also struggled with an eating disorder for most of my high school experience and then went to a treatment center for that. And that brings me to this conversation uh, most specifically uh, because I do a lot of advocacy work within um, inclusion uh, of different um, gender identities, um, sexual and minorities, uh, and just kind of different people within the eating disorder space, especially recovery. Um, so that's kind of why I'm here. Um, Eric, did you want to introduce yourself? Yes. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Eric Dorsa. I go by they, them. Um, and I, too, am so grateful to the Alliance and Southern Smash for inviting me here today to have this really awesome conversation with Skylar. Um, and I too am an advocate for LGBTQ persons seeking recovery, mental wellness, um, as well as inclusivity. Um, I currently live in Chicago, Illinois, though I am originally from Texas and I got out of there. <laughs> so um, I'm just really grateful to, to meet you, Skylar. This is my first time meeting you, but I'm so honored and I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Absolutely. Well, I think that kind of leads into a question that I want to ask you, which is, which is about that kind of recovery process and acceptance. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering what you think uh, the path to, to, you know, unlearning all the things that we've learned that are crappy about ourselves and our bodies, um, and then actually moving towards full acceptance uh, entails for you. Yeah. Um, so I was diagnosed with an eating disorder very young. I was diagnosed from eight to I didn't really seek treatment for an eating disorder until 18. Okay. And then I would say like, I fully embraced this idea of recovery being possible because I wanted recovery. I just didn't really know what that was or how that looked. And coming from my background, you know, it was a very poor Latin family in Texas. There wasn't a lot of resources available. And so um, I really believe that once I began thinking that recovery was possible for me, um, was probably around the age 21, 22. And, um, and for me, my recovery has been very synonymous with learning to embrace and accept not only myself as a queer person, I'm also a drag queen and that's very much a part of who I am. And there's so many nuances with drag. Um, for some people, it's a costume. For me, it's an expression of a different part of my gender identity. And, um, as well as like accepting that I am a, a gay person, I'm attracted to some to the same gender um, expression as myself. So my recovery journey, I would say, is very synonymous with a lot of unlearning um, messages that I learned about myself growing up through a culture, through religion, through, even through my family, about what it meant to be a male and what it meant to live in my you know, Hispanic culture, what it meant to be Catholic, what it, you know, there were all these roles that I had to live in. And the biggest one is that I had to be good. And so a lot of my recovery has been about unlearning those narratives and leaning on people and connecting with people within my own community who are also seeking healing and understanding and support um, to unlearn those narratives because they were such a crucial part of my identity and what I thought I needed to believe in order to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And the eating disorder kind of grew out of that mess <laughs> as a way to cope with a lot of emotions and feelings and beliefs um, that as a child, I didn't have the emotional intelligence and articulation to talk about what was going on. And I didn't feel safe. I felt like I was the bad guy to kind mm -hmm. of keep it in simple terms. Like, sure. because these things about me are different and popping up and make me different from those around me that fit in, mm -hmm. um, therefore I'm the one with the problem. And I just learned to bury those with what Brene Brown calls secrecy, silence, and judgment. Mm -hmm. And my way of coping with all of that was the eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And so when I really began believing that recovery was possible, you know, coming, I, I sought recovery before coming out of the closet. Mm. And 
it really became apparent that in order to stay in recovery, I had to start speaking these truths, these fears, these unspeakables. And the first one was that I was attracted to men. Um, and I felt so much shame around that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then as that recovery began to grow, and I, and I realized that like there were two discomforts happening. There was the pain of being in the disorder and the pain of being uncomfortable with these truths about myself. The disorder felt impossible, but acknowledging these truths and sharing these truths, as scary as they were, they were uncomfortable, but they didn't feel impossible. Mm. And so when I began to face these, these secrets that I had buried so deep, they were secrets for myself, I got better because mm-hmm. I was able to make connections, because I was able to show up in my life more authentically. And so I feel like now in terms of full acceptance... Um, I believe that's my trajectory, but I give myself grace and I give myself room to realize that like I spent a lifetime learning very painful things and going through very painful experiences. And so it's almost like I kind of recircle this path around them from time to time in my life. So I'm always kind of learning how to fully accept myself. And one of the biggest tools I have is by giving people around me ability to be themselves Mm -hmm. and challenging the judgments that come up and the fears that come up about if I let this person be them, then what does that mean about me? Mm. And, um, and that's been very helpful. That makes a lot of sense. I like what you said about acceptance. Um, and I think one of the, I think a lot about acceptance and I actually, this might sound kind of contradictory, but I kind of like to throw out the concept of like full acceptance. I think that there's like this, if you do that, where we're working towards this attempt to um, like fully just like, I, I don't know, the full doesn't resonate with me because I think there's always going to be things in conflict. I think life is about conflict and chaos and things not matching up uh, and things being difficult. And I think when for me, kind of like, I don't know, reflecting back what you're saying, um, letting go of this idea that I was going to one day being this like, me in this moment of like 100% euphoria where everything was wonderful all the time it was like oh like that's you're like a Buddha <laughs> you exactly. know like I like exactly and, you know no you know no judgment to folks who are seeking enlightenment all that kind of stuff through Buddhism but I do think that it's really important to recognize that there's at least for me part of my journey with with um recovery has been acceptance of the of the difficult moments and, and able like the ability to tolerate them knowing that I can get through those moments um, and I think that that's like kind of what you're saying, using the eating disorder to cope with difficult moments, cope with the silence, shame and judgment um, was a way to like not, you know, confront them and like pretend they didn't exist, um, but created more pain, right? At the same time. It did. I always tell people my eating disorder was my solution and it had its own nasty bag of tricks and consequences. Sure. And like the first step for me was like, I had to address the eating disorder head on. Mm-hmm. And then it was almost like if that was the tip of the iceberg, there was all of this stuff underneath that was like a lot of fear, experiences, trauma um, around my identity, especially. Mm-hmm. And um, and also like it was hard navigating an often cis heteronormative female world of recovery. I was oftentimes the only male Um, and then also I didn't really fit that box either. (laughs) I didn't know that at the time. And oftentimes like it it was, it was hard because there weren't really people who sounded like me and had gone through the things that I was going through. And so I felt like my, in the beginning, like my recovery was just like this other box. It was like check other and then go off to the other room. Mm -hmm. And I learned part of this like full acceptance, which Um, Or just this path of acceptance is recognizing that like my experiences and my recovery are, are mine Mm -hmm. and they're just as valid and they're just as important. And so like, I guess, what are some of the things that you felt were crucial in terms of like learning and unlearning about yourself? Yeah, I think like for me, um, learning that I was transgender, that I am transgender was the most important part of my recovery. Um, like you, I, I needed to address the eating disorder first because I kind of imagine it as like all of this garbage on top of everything and you have to like take it out before you can fix what's underneath. Um, and kind of like, it's almost superficial, if that makes sense. 
uh, I don't mean to be dismissive of the eating disorder, but it wasn't the issue, right? Like underneath is what was the issue. Um, and so I, the first, like, I think, you know, month or two in, in residential treatment for me were about kind of like taking off those pieces of the eating disorder so I could really expose what was underneath, which was that I'm trans. Um, and that was such like gaining the language to talk about my body and myself and the incongruence that I felt, uh, through, um, you know, other people, meeting other trans people was life-saving to me and probably the, the, the pivotal moment in my recovery. Um, and I think it's important though, to note that at least for me, like my transness was not the reason I had an eating disorder and it was not the cure to like, you know, understand that I was trans. It was definitely a factor and a very large, significant one. But I also had to really invest in eating disorder treatment itself um, of the actual eating disorder. And I think that's key to remember because I think a lot of people think, um, you know, when they figure out their identities or if they, you know, go through any kind of transition as, as a trans person, um, it's going to like cure their mental health issues. And it definitely can ameliorate a lot of things, but it, it's not a cure. Um, and I think that it's really important to recognize the kind of importance of both, right? The importance of taking care of mental health, regardless of one's identity, and also taking care of one's identity, regardless of mental health, <laughs> um, and kind of holding that duality. Um, so for me, I, again, I think that was that was really key. Uh, and I think another part of that was interacting with other trans folks who talked about their bodies in a similar way that I did, so that I could recognize kind of just, I think, one, not feel alone there and not feel like I was crazy, but then also just recognize what that was and learn what to do about it. And I think one of the key, sorry, you were going to say. Oh, no, I think like it's amazing. And just one of the things that I've learned with recovery is um, when I show up and I allow people to speak to me in my experience, and this is like kind of, I would say like initially just with curiosity, mm -hmm. I've learned that like recovery isn't always about seeking answers, but in community, we find that maybe we all have a lot of the similar questions. Sure. So I'm not crazy for having this question. Mm -hmm. I find that to be like more often than not, when I connect with someone else in recovery, even if, whether I'm struggling or I've met someone new, it's like, we may not have the answers for each other, but it's like, oh, we have the same questions. Okay, cool. cool. We're not alone. Yeah. And I think honestly, having the same questions can be like such a, such a significant, like central part of a good relationship or meaningful connection is wondering the same things. You know, um, I do a lot of work in schools uh, with kids and one of the most common things that, that teachers are nervous about about kids is when kids don't know the answers to things. And I'm not talking about academics. I'm talking about like identity. And there's a tendency, I think, for adults around kids to be like, no, no, you don't, you know yourself. You're totally fine. Like there's no confusion. Like you are exactly this, this, and this. And like telling a kid who they are because parents and adults are so afraid of kids not knowing. When in reality, that not knowing, that discomfort, that confusion is like the key point of growing up. And oh, yeah. we just don't let kids sit in it. We don't let kids be confused. We don't let kids ask questions about who they are. We don't let kids explore. And we teach them through that that they need to know exactly who they are at all times. And if they don't, something's wrong with them. Would um, you say that as um, queer people, there's more pressure for us to know who we are because uh, <laughs> most of the question. time growing up, we're faking it. So we get really good at acting like the other kids. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think it depends on the kid for sure. Like, I think some people feel like an immense pressure to fit in and kind of overcompensate. And I, like, I definitely went through like a hyper feminine phase where I was absolutely overcompensating. Um, but, uh, but I think for some people, there's like, there's the opposite as well. So I think it can be complex. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that everybody feels like they need to know themselves. And when they don't, it's very discomforting or, or what's the right word, disorienting. And I think the more we can as like as adults, as advocates, as people who maybe mentor or talk with young people, the more we can normalize the experience of like not knowing an answer about oneself um, and, and being comfortable with exploring, I think the better. Yeah, I, I definitely, that's been a lot of like, we call it, um, I'm also sober. So in the sober community, we call it growing up in public. Mm, <laughs> and I right. love it. So much of my childhood and all these formative years were about like, shaming myself, judging myself. Like I wasn't really present for my life. So when I finally entered recovery, I mean, I didn't even know things like, what's my favorite color? I now know it's periwinkle. Not only is it recovering and recovering my life and moving in my life, I feel like I'm recovering my identity and letting go of this idea of lost time. Mm -hmm. and it's like really embracing the now. It's like, well, I am here now. I get to be myself 
now and discover and explore who that is. And that was really scary at first. There's, there's a, I think there's a tendency for a lot of queer kids to sort of like, there's a loss of childhood or, or an early loss of innocence um, in terms of like, in terms of childhood, because we have to grow up quickly often because we have to be these people that we don't, we aren't. Um, or we feel like we must. And then if you add mental health issues onto that, which, you know, there's higher frequency of mental health issues within the LGBTQ population, um, there's a, another loss in that space. And I know that a lot of folks grapple, especially I think like during young adulthood or the sort of middle adulthood who are queer with like, where did my childhood go? And there's a, there's like a growing up that happens in adulthood as opposed to pre-adulthood or into adulthood that I think is key. And I've been thinking a lot about that because um, I think especially as a trans person, like one's transition can take up a lot of mental space and just a lot of like energy um, and everything's focused on that. And like that becomes the growing up. And now I've, I've been in transition for many years, uh, over five years at this point. Um, and I'm starting to realize it's like, there's so many other pieces of my growing up that I didn't do. Uh, so much more exploration. You said favorite color, like, you know, what do I want to do in my free time? Like, what do I want to do? Like, how do I want to interact with people, um, you know, outside of my gender? And what, how do, how do I want to show up in the world? And what do I want to do with my life, right? Like, I think these are really normal questions. Um, but a lot of times people kind of do it developmentally in like high school or college. Whereas there's a way in which I think a lot of queer folks can have have to kind of do that later and it's this duality of like growing up early and then growing up really late <laughs> um, i know yeah. Ugh. that's a perfect way of describing it you know there is a lot of body image and and shame around our bodies i would say in eating disorders in general but you know, how did how do you feel like recovery has helped you kind of navigate this journey of when you feel like your body isn't well obviously like your body needs to transition to be who you are. How do you navigate, like, how do you navigate that? And like all of these messages that still exist in our culture around who we should be, how we should look, you know, I, I, I mean, I feel like it's on both sides. Um, how, how, how do you find recovery helps you navigate that? Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. The first thing is that I always want to make sure that, that we, when we're talking about trans folks and transition, there's no need to transition in sort of a general sense. Like I personally needed to transition for myself, but I, I want to make sure that the narrative is not like trans people have to transition or all trans people transition and all people's transitions look the same. Like there's like transitions are different for everybody. Not everybody transitions, not everybody wants surgery or hormones or names or whatever changed. Like, and I think it's super important that we reinforce that narrative um, or sorry, rather change the narrative from, you know, every trans person transitions and all transitions look the same to trans people do what they want with their bodies, right? Um, and everybody's you know journey is different. Um, but yes, for me, I felt I needed to transition uh, and I needed to shift things about my body to feel more congruent. I think what complicates it with eating disorder stuff is the sort of mixed messaging that there is and and just misinformation that there is about body. Um, and so you know we know the term gender dysphoria, which is the incongruence that or the distress that arises from the incongruence that a trans person might experience. Um, due to their body uh, and their, you know, their bio, their assigned sex, uh, really their birth sex, um, matching or not matching their gender identity, right? Um, so for me, like I felt dysphoria about my breasts because I didn't feel like they matched me. Um, that's just an example of dysphoria. Then we have um, body dysmorphia, so dysphoria and dysmorphia. That really has much more to do with body dysmorphic disorder, but people like to throw it in with eating disorder stuff, but that's not 100% correct. And then there's body image distortions or body image issues, which is a much more broader category. Um, but I think it's really important to be able to distinguish between these two, especially when we're looking at recovery because um, transition, so actually like changing things with regards to gender dysphoria can't actually help somebody who has gender dysphoria. Whereas, as you might, as you probably know, manipulating your body when you have body image issues doesn't do anything. It makes it hard. It's like throwing gasoline on a campfire. Exactly. Did that explode. <laughs> And the reason is that gender dysphoria is an issue of, of congruence or incongruence of self-identity, right? So gender dysphoria is an issue of identity, whereas body image distortions are usually an issue of like a lack of control feeling or self-worth. And those things are like distinctly different roots and they might present the same way. They also might influence each other, but at the root, they're different. And I think it's really difficult sometimes for trans folks to distinguish what's what. Um, I would imagine it's, it, yeah. I mean, in my, even in my own recovery, you know, coming as like non-conforming because drag is and has always been 
a very big part of my identity. Like I never felt like a little boy growing up. I wasn't treated like a little boy growing up. And it it was a source of a lot of my shame and a lot of my pain. Sure. And I really appreciate, you know, saying that trans is trans and trans experiences are definitely a spectrum and unique to that person. Just like we don't, you know, it's never helpful to cast. It's like saying all people who wear blue shirts are the same and it's just not right. true. And, um, I definitely feel like one of the things that I really struggled with in my recovery was, was body image because I started um, dressing up in, in, in drag and building a persona, which realized, I realized like, oh, this isn't a persona. This is me in a different outfit. This is, I'm still very much present as myself and recovery has really helped me really um, love that part of myself that I, I learned to hate growing up and throw in the closet, and lock the door and say, don't talk and don't speak. Um, and being able to navigate like the body image aspect of, you know, putting on a different like person, mm-hmm. you know, expressing a different side of myself. Um, I realized like before I thought it was like, well, I just have to love like body in order to cure body image. I have to love myself no matter what. And what I've learned in what I continue to come back to is loving myself and realizing that I'm worthy of love, connection, and belonging is not determined by my body. Mm. And the way that the world chooses to see my body as valid or not valid, my drag identity as valid or not valid, that it, goes, it always goes back to that unlearning, realizing that I, as a human being with a lived experience, and worthy of love and belonging, regardless of like what my brain or what society is telling me that I need to be. Because it is on, I, I always tell people like, shame is organized by gender, but the toy inside is still the same. It's still, I'm not enough or I'm not good enough, or mm-hmm. I won't be able to show up as myself and be accepted. Mm-hmm. And um, when I started coming to terms with my my gender expression in my life and how uncomfortable it made a lot of people in my family Mm -hmm. Uh, but realizing that i wasn't going to give up my recovery for anybody Mm -hmm. that kind of became this like anchoring point for me that the most powerful tool i have to validate myself is that i am freer to be in recovery and i'm more available to love people as myself not less Mm. available. yeah that makes me think a lot about something i tell kids often, which is that I think it's easy to, it's easy to see invalidation everywhere, right? Especially as a, as a queer kid, especially as a queer person, openly queer person, super, super easy to get invalidation from lots of different places, whether implicitly or explicitly. Um, and one of the things I think a lot about is reminding ourselves that other people's opinions of us are not facts and they are not like, they're not even necessarily true to other people, right? I think it's really easy to see some, somebody say something negative or hear somebody say something negative and extrapolate that to one, be true. And two, think everybody else thinks it's true. Uh, When in the reality, it's one person's truth and, or one person's opinion. So I always like to remind myself that when somebody tries to invalidate me, and this can be about body, it can be about body image, it can be about anything really. Um, But, you know, since we're talking about eating disorders and body, let's say it's about that. If, if they say something negative about me or assume something negative about me, that's actually a reflection of them mm-hmm. and their values, their judgments, their stereotypes, their childhood and how they were raised, their eating disorder <laughs> um, or their issues with themselves, right? Um, and not about me. And that doesn't mean that their words or their actions can't hurt me. Of course they can. Yeah. And I want to tend to those wounds. I want to take care of myself, but I never want to use their words as weapons against myself, Right. I think we have a tendency as an internalization is to take other people's words, other people's attacks, and then use them against ourselves because yeah. that's how we, we know. Um, and I, like, I, I vehemently, fiercely want to make sure to put a space between me and somebody else's truth, somebody else's opinion of me, right? Yeah, it kind of leads us into, you know, our last, my last, like the last question. Um, sure. So how, how do you feel your life has kind of evolved beyond an eating disorder and allowed you to advocate most importantly for yourself and then other people? Yeah, I think, I mean, release of the eating disorder, I'm going to say, um, was the number one thing that allowed me to have my life. So I think like there's part of this, which is that without, without having healed right from my eating disorder or moved on from it, released it from, or released myself from its, its hold, 
I wouldn't, I, I don't think I a would be here. I know that sounds intense, but that's the first thing. And mm -hmm. second of all, I wouldn't be able to show up even if I was here. Um, and I think one of the things that I've been able to do through my recovery is show up and be present. And there was a way in which my eating disorder barred me from ever being completely present anywhere. And I don't think that we can ever reach a full potential of any kind or even any kind of potential, to be honest with you, without being present. Um, and not only that, in terms of like productivity in the world and, and you know, acting in the world as, as a, like a, I don't know, a productive member of society, but also just as like a, like a person who's happy <laughs> and who like has emotions and who values oneself. If you can't truly be present with yourself, how are you supposed to like truly enjoy anything? Um, so it's something that I think about often, actually, I uh, just grateful, you know, grateful that it's that I've been able to move on. And I think the most the, the key moment for me in recognizing that I had actually moved forwards was forgetting. And I think forgetting is a privilege and it's a mark of recovery when one starts to forget that one experienced these things or when it isn't a daily like part of one's life, when you stop counting the days of recovery, when you stop counting the days since relapse or whatever, and you forget. And I think like I was a moment last year, I was actually asked to give a talk on eating disorders and I, I realized I'd forgotten how awful it was. And I was like, holy crap, that, that is my recovery right there. The fact that I've, I've forgotten it. Um, and I guess the reason I wanted to share this part in closing is I want people to remember the happens because there was never a day in my recovery that I was like, oh yeah, one day I'm going to forget this happened. I was like, this is going to be the most important part of my life forever. And I'm always going to remember this. I'm always going to feel this pain and somehow I'm just going to deal with it better. But that's not actually the case. Like there's actually a place now that I am that I forget about it very often um, in, in, a, in a beautiful way. That means I'm like truly present and truly living my life. Um, so I'm, I guess what I'm wondering for you is if, you, if, you, if you've had that experience too. Absolutely. Uh, I feel like I never, I never thought recovery was going to be possible for me. I, I started at such a young age um, and perfectionism even showed up in the early days of my recovery where I felt like I had to be perfect and do it perfectly and follow the meal plan and all that stuff. And, and, um, and what, it was a very profound moment where I was, I would say like white knuckling it. That I, I used to say that all the time too. <laughs> yeah, I realized that recovery is, that's the disease, just in a different, the dis-ease that I was feeling, the, the disorder, um, if you will, just coming in a, like in a different way. And that I really felt like I had to let go of a lot of that shame, that recovery, that I can absolutely be in struggle and still mm -hmm. in seeking recovery that I can trip and not fall down the stairs, but I can trip and go up the stairs. And mm -hmm being able to experience that freedom in my life because, you know, I was having to put myself through treatment a lot of the time. It really helped me realize um, that I could have my life back and that there wasn't something wrong with me, that I wasn't broken. Mm -hmm. I kept trying to fix myself, fix myself, fix myself, fix myself. And that was never broken, that this is absolutely a part of who I am. And I've learned so much from that. And being in it and honestly saved my life. And I got that message from other people who mm -hmm. had the same questions I did. And so my, the reason why I give back is because my recovery did not happen in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of people willing to show up and love me and allow me to love them and have questions. And in that I was able to grow. And so now it's like, I feel this, it's an honor and a privilege to get to have this conversation with you to help build the world that I would have needed when I was getting sick. Sure. And, um, and to provide voice to experience that maybe a lot of people are going through, but they don't know how to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so giving back in that way, in a lot of ways keeps me in my own recovery. But I do forget them. Like I'm so, like you said, like I love it. It's like, I don't forget that I went through that. No, oh, yeah. I, the pain and the the pain is no longer greeting me in the morning when I wake up. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's like anxiety and joy. <laughs> I feel like Let's anxiety go. kind of hangs around, hangs out often. Yeah, especially with the world, the way the world's going right now. So no. um, I wanted to add one last thing before we wrap up, which is that I think um, this idea of recovery being possible, um, I remember being like pre-recovery, let's say, like before I had really committed to it, um, and being like, like recovery is not possible. And I am not even going to engage in it until or if I believe that recovery is possible. Then I was kind of like forced into it in many different ways. I mean, I elected, but I felt very much like people were like, you got to go. Right. Um, 
and I, and I really was convinced that I was going to white knuckle the rest of my life. I was just going to have to hold on and, and, and be okay. Um, and I didn't, I didn't believe recovery is possible and I didn't recover. And this is the key is I didn't recover because I believed recovery is possible. I believe that maybe there was something that was different from what I was experiencing. Yeah. And I think this is key because I think people go into recovery thinking they have to believe in some kind of like future and like see all the steps. You don't have to see all the steps. You definitely don't have to see the ending. You just have to take the next step. And I think that's like the key part of recovery is you, you don't even have to see any kind of ending, any kind of destination. You just have to take that next step. Well, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Really cool to connect with you. Yeah, um, I look forward to doing it again. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for watching, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.